Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, whatever you're doing. This is uh, a special extra uh, that we do because some of you will know that there was uh, there was news from Venus. And one of the many things that we've always done with Shambles is we've always promised uh, any news from Venus should it arrive. Uh, the last time was merely it was a repeat episode of the Avengers uh, story from Venus with Love. This one actually has some science to it. Uh, and we're going to be joined by uh, Chris Lintot. Thank you again, by the way, everyone who's supports us uh, via uh, Patreon. Uh, that is tremendously useful and it's why we can suddenly immediately just uh, make things. So, Chris Lintop, it's lovely to have you here this morning. You had a very busy afternoon yesterday and it's an interesting thing. So for, the, for those who don't know, ba basically the rumbles began this week that something which perhaps meant there was the, a, a, an increased possibility of, uh, of of living creatures on another planet within our solar system. The kind of the rumours spread. Some people had started doing some really, uh, I, I would say, uh, overly uh, ornate drawings of the possibility of life on Venus. But tell us, what is it that uh, has been discovered? So, um, yeah, go on. Yeah, should we get? Let's start with what, because I think that if we get that right, then we can happily talk about it for for the rest of the time. But um, what's been discovered is a gas called phosphine. It's been discovered with radio telescopes here on Earth, pointed at Venus by uh, a wonderful scientist called Jane Greaves in Cardiff and uh, her team. Uh, and phosphine is interesting because on Earth it's only made by life, so it's made by you can get it by attacking concrete with acid if that's something you want to do in a factory, so that counts as life. It's found in the intestines of some animals, and particularly penguins have caught the imagination. Um, it's basically not produced very much, and actually we don't really understand how life on Earth produces it, but where you see it, you know that there's life. And so the reason for looking at it in the cosmos is that if you see it, one conclusion might be that there's life there. So. Jane and her team deliberately pointed their telescopes at Venus to look for phosphine to test whether there was life there. And I think somewhat to their surprise, they found some. Uh, they found that phosphine in the atmosphere is about 20 parts per billion, um, which doesn't sound like a lot, but that's a pretty stonking detection by these standards. So, so it's definitely there. And the other intriguing thing is that it's high up in the atmosphere. So you think of Venus, you think of this sort of sinister twin of Earth with a, a surface hot enough to melt lead. But the phosphine is found about 50 kilometers up, about halfway to space. Um, and at that point, the temperature is about 20 to 30 centigrade. So it's a decent summer's day. The air pressure is very similar to Earth. It's still fairly hostile because it's an acidic environment. But it's sort of where you might speculate about having life amidst the clouds of Venus. So either there's some weird chemistry that we don't understand, that produces this phosphine, or there are little acid resistant bacteria swimming around in the clouds of Venus uh, producing it for us. Now, can we just, by the way, it sounds therefore like the uh, the screenwriters of the sequel to Happy Feet now have uh, a, a new angle to deal with. But it's also, I, I'm fascinated by what people might wonder is pointing a radio telescope to then see phosphine. They would not necessarily, I, I think even though people are au uh, fait with the idea of, of different forms of telescope, they still don't necessarily know how does a radio telescope detect something like phosphine. So, so yeah, it's a really good question. So the first thing to realise is that Venus is really bright at the wavelengths that we're talking about. So actually one of the biggest problems with this measurement is that Venus is really bright and that makes it difficult. Um, but so you have a background hum of, of radiation at all wavelengths across uh, across the spectrum from Venus. But then there's a particular wavelength at which the bonds in the phosphine molecule are excited and vibrate. And what that means is that if you look at that wavelength, the phosphine absorbs some of the some of the um, background radiation. So you see a dip if you plot. We like graphs, but if you plot the amount of radio waves you get with wavelength, you see this dip at precisely this wavelength that indicates that it's phosphine. Different molecules do this at different wavelengths. And so essentially you tune your radio telescope to the wavelength that you think phosphine will absorb at, and you compare that to to either uh, to, to what's happening either side. It's that dip that tells you that, that it's there. And so the team did this with a telescope called uh, JCMT, which is on Mauna Kea in Hawaii. And when they first looked at their data, they thought it was awful. Um, it's such a difficult thing to do. Venus is, is bright. You get all sorts of background radiation bouncing around. And they actually put the data in, in a drawer for a little bit 
uh, and and put it aside. Um, and then a, a few months, a few years later, Jane had some time to work on this and and spent some time digging properly into the data and, and convinced herself that there was this dip and that they'd found phosphine. And then she did two things. One was she told us on the sky at night that she went to Sainsbury's and made a curry and was wandering mm -hmm. around Sainsbury's in Cambridge, wondering if she was the only person there who thought they'd discovered alien life. Um, possibly not, you know. Um, and then the second thing was they decided they needed a backup. So they spent a lot of time trying to get time on a telescope called ALMA in Chile, which is more sensitive. Uh, and ALMA had never been used to do this kind of information. Uh, this observation, and they, they managed to see the same dip. So we've seen it in two different telescopes at two different times. And that's one of the things that I think um, makes me confident that this really is phosphine in the atmosphere. I think what's lovely about that story in, in, in one way as well is the fact that here's some things that were just in the drawer that I thought I'd then go, let's have a look. In the same way, we were talking to you know Paul Nurse recently, and you know he threw something in the bin, and then he suddenly had doubts and went all the way back to the lab late on Friday night, took it out of the bin, and this was the journey towards winning the Nobel Prize. You know, these, these are kind of... That's uh, right. Yeah, I, yeah. I think these are lovely stories. Uh, do you know what? I've got a bit of free afternoon. I'm just going to have a little look there at that. This is um, hopefully, uh, Jake Duran, your, your uh, question, what is phosphine, I think has been answered. Thank you for that, that question. I'm going to go. We, we, we've had a bunch of questions. But in fact, just before we get there, which is how does it change for you? The I, I mean, most people I've spoken to, cosmologists uh, and, and, and broadly within science, say that there is a gut instinct that there must be life and perhaps complex life. In fact, indeed, complex life in a universe of this size, indeed, even in a galaxy of this size. But how much does that change your instinct if you start to find clues of life or indeed that this does lead to actual evidence that we have some form of uh of, 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 of basic life so so i think if this is life in uh, amongst the clouds of venus it really pushes the needle towards life being at least simple life being very common elsewhere in, in the galaxy this is such a unearth like planet even though what we think we're seeing is high in the clouds this is such an unusual environment. It's not watery. It's highly, it's very, very acidic, more acidic than any environment on Earth. Um, it may also be the, the last remnants of a once great Venusian ecosystem, because Venus used to be a much nicer place to live on the surface. So maybe as the planet heated up, life sort of retreated to this last place. So I, I think it, one thing it does is it makes me really think that life is, is going to be common through the universe. Um, and that's really exciting. The other thing it does is it makes me slightly pessimistic about our attempts to understand that simple life. Um, people all over the world are gearing up to use telescopes like um, the James Webb Space Telescope, which will hopefully launch shortly, to look for biosignatures, to look at, at gases in the atmospheres of exoplanets, planets around other stars. And Venus is right there. And we've used big telescopes and we can potentially go and visit it. And we still don't understand what's going on. It, and, and yesterday we weren't able to say whether this was life or not. If we can't do that for Venus, it's made me realize how difficult it's going to be to talk about this story in 10 years time when maybe we found oxygen in an Earth-like planet's atmosphere. Uh, so I, th I think it illustrates how hard sort of recognizing life might be anywhere in the, in the universe. Mm. Thank you. This is right. I've got here. We've got a bunch of questions. This is from M. Stanley. M. Stanley would like to know how is this different? Uh, that how is phosphine dis discoveries uh, from those phosphine discoveries made on Jupiter, which I know nothing about. Yeah. So, so phosphine. I got a lot of this on Twitter yesterday. So, phosphine is found. Where, we talked about where it is on Earth. It's found in the atmospheres of Jupiter and Saturn. It was found in the late seventies, uh, I think, by Voyager, um, but possibly from the ground. Um, and and so so that's kind of kind of interesting. But what's happening there is the pressure deep within the atmospheres of the gas giants drives a completely different chemistry to anything that might be happening on Venus. So we know that how Jupiter makes its phosphine can't that can't be happening on Venus. So so that's a bit of a red herring. We sort of expected it in gas giants. We don't expect it without life in um, on rocky planets like Venus. Uh, Vanessa would like to know uh, what the difference is basically between saying something is life and something is organic. Uh, good question. Uh, I think it depends on who you're asking. If you're a chemist, an organic molecule is one with carbon. In. So we often use that as shorthand for complex chemistry. 
And then life is something, some sort of advanced chemical pattern that repeats or reproduces in some sense. Definitions of life get really hazy uh, around here. If we had particularly places like Titan, which have complex chemistry, they definitely have organic chemistry. But whether that gets to anything as complicated as a bacteria, we, we don't know. Um, but yeah, this is, and, and it's confusing here because phosphine is not strictly an organic molecule. It's got no carbon. It's just it's just phosphorus and three hydrogens. Um, that's all it is. It's a nice, simple little molecule. Um, but it is this. It's believed to be the sign that life might exist. Uh, SC's question, which I think is possibly a health and safety nightmare, is what's the likelihood of a manned mission to Venus? Um, so you could take a crewed mission, I guess. You wouldn't want to go down into the surface. People in, in science fiction have written about floating cities uh high in the clouds of venus so there is some brilliant 50s and 60s sci-fi about picking out this exactly this habitable zone and um, the acid's a bit of a problem um if it wasn't for the acid and you had a, a floating balloon at the right altitude of venus you could step outside and 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 breathe i mean you suffocate but the pressure and temperature would be would be fine um, i think the next thing we need to do is we need to get an instrument called a mass spectrometer which will tell us what other molecules are, are present um, to Venus and there's a the beginnings of a proposal for a balloon mission that would go and float around for a few few weeks um, on the table. The Russians did that in the 80s with two probes called uh, I think Vena I think is the, the name of the probe and they detected phosphorus but they didn't know what molecule the phosphorus was in so we need to we need to go back with some balloons that's the next step. Well, of course, this has been very exciting. It's nice when cosmology and chemistry uh, arrive. And of course, that means we've had uh, very uh, deep uh, philosophical questions from uh, chemists such as Andreas Seller, who wants to know what's it smell like? Um, I would ask Andrea that normally. Phosphine smells awful. Uh, I'm told it, it, it's a hideous gas. It's, I, it's I never... one of those rotting fish garlicky ones, isn't it? I that think kind that's of... right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Phosphor, phosphor compounds in general smell like that. I do know we, we tried to make some in the lab at Cardiff University where we, where we filmed and the health and safety people were very upset. It's not a nice thing. It's pretty volatile and pretty nasty. And that's actually a problem because it's, it's not a nice chemical. It's hard to work with um, and it smells. Um, we don't know much about its chemistry. So, so the team tried to predict how much phosphine you could form via known chemistry. They came up with a number that you could only form a 10,000th of what's seen. But the truth is we don't really understand much of that chemistry very well because chemists have a natural reluctance to work with really dangerous. Some chemists have a natural reluctance to work with really dangerous smelly chemicals. But I bet lots of people are writing grant proposals this morning asking for students to go looking for, for phosphine chemistry in the lab. Yeah, well, I mentioned health and safety nightmares, and of course, uh, Andreas Seller always is, which is one of his joys. It always, anything that smells of garlic, apart from garlic, always worries me. I think it's tellurium. Is is it tellurium, which is the uh, element which is uh, smells like garlic? Then you smell like garlic. Then you're dead, basically, uh, uh, after a bit of contact. Yeah, with best that. avoided, I think, on Venus or elsewhere. Uh, Adam Bateman would like to know uh, how long would it take a pro to get to Venus to get data on the clouds to tell us either way uh, if there are microbes or not. So getting there is pretty easy. Venus is just next door, after all. But none of the and there are existing probes to Venus planned, but nothing that's been approved has anything on board that will help. The focus until now has been studying Venus's surface, where we think there might be volcanoes and things like that. So, I think we might be talking about ten years uh, before we get a probe there. But there are some of these new space, these small companies like there's one called Rocket Lab that have anyway been looking at sending micro probes to Venus, basically for fun. Um, and I think then they will now be looking at whether you could get a, a suitably small mass spectrometer or something useful on, on board. Uh, Linda Shuttleworth would like to know uh, whether this discovery implies that there might also have been life on the surface of Venus. How much conjecture? And I realise this is all you know pretty playful. No, this at, is the at this fun point. part. We could just build conjecture as long as we've said that we don't know whether this is chemistry or life. We will now proceed as if this is life and, and talk about what might might happen. Yeah. So I don't think that there can be life there now. It, it's just too hot for the kind of complex chemistry that that we think life needs. But. As I said, in the early part of its history, Venus was a much more temperate place, we think. Um, it had a much less thick atmosphere, it was much less acidic, and it would have been quite Earth-like. So you can imagine a scenario where life gets going on both Venus and Earth pretty quickly, 
And then as Venus becomes uh, the planet it is today, life retreats from the surface and, and you end up with this airborne biology. Um, so, so I think it's a sign that things must have been very complex in the past. And that, that when we were talking earlier about why, what this tells us about life elsewhere, I think one of the things it tells us is that, that life will, once you get life started, it will cling on wherever it can. Because if you can evolve to exist in a highly acidic environment in the atmosphere, um, then, then all the arguments that people make that life on Earth adapts to all kinds of environments suddenly apply on, on, on other planets. So, so maybe once there were, there were Venusians and, and life on the surface, but, but no longer. That was, uh, the, uh, we should mention, just so you mention Venusians, by the way, a, a little book I'd recommend if, if no one, uh, Patrick Moore's Can You Speak Venusian is a very entertaining book uh, about, I forget what he calls the people in that. Uh, something... Independent thinkers independent thinkers that's it it is about in now unfortunately of course as we know independent thinkers were, were a quirk when he wrote this book independent thinkers now unfortunately run various conspiracy sites uh on, on the internet but but can I, you, it's great my, it's a great my read. favorite thing about can you speak venusian it was originally a, a one-off documentary you can sometimes find it online but it, the joy of it is patrick interviews all these people including somebody who says he can speak venusian because of rays that are being transmitted to him um and he just interviews them completely straight and it's very lovely and gentle and the only sign that they're not taken completely seriously is the fact that the program was broadcast on the first of may and the theme tune is just Patrick playing Here We Go Gathering Nuts in May on the piano. <laughs> it is, I think it's up at the moment, actually. I forget the name. It's, it's a, it was a wonderful BBC series that went for There's many one years. Pa one Pair of Eyes. One Pair of Eyes. There's a brilliant one about Marty Feldman. There's a fantastic one about the visionary artist Cecil Collins. If right, if you've got nothing else to do today, just just start watching those things and start with the Can You Speak Venusian episode because, and as, as I say, the book is, is wonderful as well. Um, this is from Christopher M, uh, who would like to know, if this turns out out to just be some sort of new chemistry how do we how do we convince people that's just as exciting as life or is it yeah that, that that's a really good point because because the exciting thing is that we we learn something e either way and there isn't a straightforward explanation here i was we got to make make a program about this which went out last night and i was so nervous that at 405 uh five minutes after the announcement was made every chemist in the world would go don't you understand that phosphine is made like this? Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and no one did. So, so, so we've got a scientific puzzle. I think what's really exciting is it tells us that the atmosphere of Venus is a dynamic place, that stuff is changing, that we don't understand it. And that, that's always exciting. The, a nice example, which was um, told to me yesterday by my friend Sarah Horst, who's a, a brilliant um, chemist of the solar system, um, she was talking about, apparently there used to be a mystery in Titan's atmosphere. And Titan's this moon of Saturn with this, this thick nitrogen atmosphere. Uh, and there was a, some, some chemistry they didn't understand in Titan's atmosphere. People started muttering about whether this could be a sign of life or, or, or so on. It wasn't as clear cut as phosphine, but it was confusing. But they realized something was missing. And they now know what they were missing, which is that Enceladus, another moon of Saturn, has water inside it that water sprays out and some of the water was getting into titan's atmosphere uh and once you add water the chemistry makes sense and you don't need life in the atmosphere of titan so i think the kind of explanation will be something as magnificent and exotic as that some uh, bizarre form of of geology some active volcanoes that are behaving in ways we don't expect um that sort of explanation it only makes venus a, a more interesting place um i I do think I am always annoyed by the folk. Whenever there's an astronomical stud story, there's a somebody says there's a press conference. The entire internet asks, "Is it aliens?" And then when it's not aliens, no one pays any attention, um, and and that is a risk here. But it, I think in this case, they they went looking for life and they found what they were looking for, and that's what makes this story a bit different. What do you think? Would is is there anything? Because I, I was writing about this last night, and I was thinking about the longevity. You know, there are certain stories which you know th this could be the start. Th th this this could be a, a major thing on you know the great big wall chart of wonderful discoveries in 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 science, or it could be a blip, couldn't it? What would turn it back into uh, a, a, an exciting blip for a day? Um, I think the biggest question that could make the story go away is whether the detections from the telescopes are real. 
So whether that that dip that I said indicated phosphine is really there or not, um, there there is quite some scepticism from from some people. I know that the referees of the paper that got published yesterday um, initially queried that, and so I know people who believe that that's not a real detection because. If you think about what they did in, in science, they, they got the data from the telescope, but they knew what they were looking for, and then they dug into the data and then they found it. Ideally, one would have done a, a blind search for molecules in Venus's atmosphere and then seen what you got and then discovered that phosphine was one of them. But they didn't have the time or the telescope uh, time to, to do that. So there will be more observations planned. There were more observations planned before the telescope in Chile got shut down, but, by the pandemic. And I think people will now go back and, and, and spend a lot of telescope time following this up. Um, so far, I think they had a total of 90 minutes of data from the telescope. Right. Um, and so if you go back and spend a lot of time looking and it's not there, that will go to a blip. But I I know the people responsible, Jane and um, Anita Richards, who's at Manchester, did most of the data reduction and they really know those telescopes really well. So I would be surprised if that happens. I've uh, just got a few more questions. Uh, uh, Hayden uh, Geraghty would like to know, uh, do you think there are tardigrades on Venus? Would they survive in that atmosphere? Every, everyone loves tardigrades. One of the great discoveries of life is surely the tardigrade. It's, it's enthused people so much. It's wonderful to see. Uh, I'm a big fan of, of tardigrades. And if you go to, if you, when we can travel again, um, there is the microbial zoo in Amsterdam, which I highly recommend a visit to. Uh, they have feeding time and you can watch them feed the tardigrades, which is just just amazing. Um, so, so yeah, I'm a big tardigrade fan. Um, my guess is that if you put sulfuric acid that's this strong on a tardigrade, bad things happen to the tardigrade. And somewhere, somebody in a lab is approaching a Petri dish with a pipette right now uh, to test this. So I, I think we'll find out. In the, in the programme we made, the, William Baines, who's the chemist on the team, had great fun putting sulfuric acid on everything because chemists are like that. Um, he made a sulfuric acid sandwich for some reason. I'm not sure what that was supposed to pr prove. And he showed that peas are destroyed. They become very mushy indeed. Um, but he did try a cactus. And the logic was that a cactus has a wax, or this particular type of cactus, has a waxy surface that resists, that holds the moisture in. And he showed that the cactus was destroyed more slowly. So maybe tardigrades will survive this and everything else. And there's something there's something kind of lovely about tardigrades swimming through the atmosphere of Venus. I think that, it, it's I a nice to, thought. The longevity of chemists is always something that I find remarkable. You know, I've looked at various different careers where we see quite short lifespans. And oddly enough, it's not chemistry. I don't know how the, uh, again, whether it's nature or nurture, we will discover how they survive so long, despite some of their uh, strange sulfurous cactus experiments. Uh, the I think Sean's story's question has kind of been answered. I don't know if you want to add any more. Sean would like to know, what are the next steps to investigate further? I think go, go, go back and look. Um, there's a lot of lab chemistry to be done. One of the things we don't understand are the reaction rates. So hopefully people will help help sort those out so that we can test that bit of it. And then, yeah, we need to send a balloon. And the final, well, actually, we've got two more questions. Patrick Hearn would like to know, presuming the source is a life form, how much biomass would we expect is needed to maintain the observed levels of phosphine? Oh, um, let's see. We did... It's really difficult to say because you have to guess how good Venusian bacteria are at producing phosphine um, and all of that. It's not a lot, if I remember correctly. Do you want to hang on and I'll look this up? Yeah, why not? You're editing. I've got this in my while, notes. While you're looking this up, I can probably yeah. give you another question from Matt Taylor, which I don't hear. Matt Taylor, uh, who you, I'm sure you know, Matt, uh, he just wants to know in, in caps lock, is it aliens? It might be aliens. That's Thank answer. you for answering in caps lock as well. Well, while uh, Chris is looking that up, just remind you that, uh, uh, again, if you can support us via uh, Patreon, that's fantastic. And also watch that Sky at Night special. That will be up on BBC iPlayer for at least a month, hopefully longer. But it's always up there for, I think, well, 28 days. Um, so, around. so so Chris yeah. North, who's one of the, the scientists at Cardiff, not the people not involved in this but he's, he's an old mate um he's done some digging and we're talking sort of kilograms of bacteria would be enough so we're not talking a lot um but they have to be long-lived because the phosphine is destroyed fast um and so there has to be a continual source of phosphine but it, it's not um an enormous you know you don't need 10 kilometer thick clouds of bacteria to to account for what we've seen
Brilliant. Thank you so much, Chris. This is a, it's a very exciting time. Even, even prog rock people are particularly excited, believing that it may well lead to another Jeff Wayne uh, prog concept album. So we, we just don't know what's going to happen there. Uh, and uh, just a reminder, we've got loads more shows coming up this week. Next week, we have Genetic Shambles. That also uh, interview with uh, Paul Nurse, who I mentioned a little bit earlier. Uh, it's coming out very soon about his new book, uh, What is Life? And Chris, your book is, uh, of course, it's still out. Zooniverse. It's Crowd and the Cosmos. Crowd and the Cosmos. Adventures in the Zooniverse. But people should watch the sky at night it, we we put a huge amount of effort to making a brilliant half hour documentary about a news story that just came out people are always saying they want the bbc to do this if you want the bbc to do this you need to go and press play on iPlayer. you don't have to watch it just press play on iPlayer on the sky at night come back to your computer half an hour later that would really help it would be nice wouldn't it if the bbc became really aware of how much people do like astronomy because uh, you know it would be nice to see you know the sky the sky at night deserves uh, attention it, it, the, the, again the talk of longevity the longevity of that show there is a reason that's made so long and i hope that at one point we also see you returning with everyone else on stargazing as well because i know a lot of people would like to see that back um thanks very much everyone for watching thank you so much chris for doing this when you've talked about these things so well i'm always impressed with me chris every now and again there's a question i throw at you and i think well he can't know that and you go well hang on a minute you never go no you go hang on a minute i think i can know that it's the first time i've ever even seen you need to use a google search very impressive <laughs> very impressive um thanks very much everyone Bye bye